all of you and welcome to the Sunset Safari on a Saturday afternoon. And as I said, what a lovely afternoon it's shaping up to be. Oh, you're looking at a herd of elephants peacefully feeding, unfortunately in the opposite direction to us. But a quick introduction for our new viewers as to who we are and where we are. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Adrian is on camera with me once again. And we are live from the Maasai Mara here in Kenya. Now because this is a live safari, what that means is that you can send through your questions on hashtag safari live on Twitter. Now, we're on the main road. We've got a little distance to cover, so let's get going because leopard on a giraffe kill. I'm a bit tiny, tiny, tiny bit concerned. Hello. That's also why I want to get off the main road. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little bit concerned that it perhaps might be in a in a slightly tricky signal area, which seems so. Uh, I seem to be saying a lot, but I think it'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. It's very close to where Brent found the cheetah den a couple of weeks ago. I could really do with a good leopard sighting. I really could. I haven't seen a leopard properly since... I can't remember when. A good leopard sighting. Oh, I do. Since I saw the female and the cub in a drainage line with no signal. But that was in September. It's November now. And Kestrel Fox, a giraffe is a very big kill for a leopard. It will be a baby giraffe, we can guarantee that. I Let's go and see what the situation is before I comment. It is. It does happen, it's been known to happen. It's a big tom leopard, so it's the dominant male of that area. Only a big male leopard would really be capable of tackling a small giraffe but it does happen there's photos of giraffe baby giraffe being dragged into trees but it's unusual which is why I'm quite excited to go and see this because it's not something that you see on a regular basis but you are absolutely correct a giraffe a baby giraffe is as big as a, a big as big a kill as it gets so we've struck lucky this afternoon, hopefully. Let's go and find out whether Brent is planning on being as lucky as we are. Well, so just after the end of the morning safari, we managed to find the five boys. They're in a bit of a bad area, so sometimes we might get a little bit of break up. Good afternoon, my name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Jahawi on camera. And believe it or not, there are five cheetahs spread through these bushes in front of us. So we found the musketeers, and um, they were quite well fed, but I'm hoping as the afternoon cools, they're going to start moving. There's quite a lot of game around here. So there's four under that bush, although we can only see one at the moment. And off to the right, oh, there's a superb starling. <laughs> so right in front of us, uh, where, there we go, straight towards where the lazy D'Artagnan is. There's a superb starling just in the bottom here. I should hop into shot now. You can just see a little bit of that iridescent shine off his his body. But behind, let me get my finger, that there is another cheetah in there. And there's a starling over there. You can just see the starling popping its head up. Being a lot more active than the cheetah. It looked like a superb starling when it dashed down. Yes, and a yellow eye. And I'm sure it's got a pretty belly. Oh, there, oh, there we go. Oh, it is not. It is a superb styling. So our plan for this afternoon is to see what the boys get up to. I am hoping they get moving. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions for us about Cheetah or the Mara or anything in general, because I think we're going to be playing the patience game today, uh, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. As I was saying, there's quite a few uh, bits of game around uh, directly opposite them on the other valley. Um, we c I can see some Thompson's gazelles in the distance. There we go. And you can see those little white specks. There's the gazelles. Hello, Tom Toms. Oh, what else have we got there? No, just Tom Toms. And Topi. Topi? No. Tommies. 
Bay. Oh, there we go, lots of little tommies. And there are quite a lot of wildebeest all around us and even some ostriches. So you never know which direction the boys are going to move in. And uh, hopefully it will be into a slightly better area. So as I was saying, if we come across to the left, we've got wildebeest and more tommies just beyond that vehicle there. There we go. You can see wildebeest, zebra, tommies, even some grants way in the distance there. So lots of potential food. It's still quite hot now. Um, probably around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, close on 30 degrees Celsius. So I think the boys are going to be sleeping for a little bit longer before they decide to do anything too much. And we've got some ostriches, it looks like. Am I are those ostriches or are my eyes playing tricks on me? Are they just the wildly beasts? There's more wildebeest there. Um, where's the vehicle? Uh, it's sort of at 90 degrees from me, I think I saw an ostrich. Hello, Philip. Um, Philip is wondering, do you... Where did my binoculars go? Sorry, let me just find them quickly. Um, Philip is wondering, do cheetahs travel far during the night? Well, Philip, it all depends um, on how full their bellies are, um, on lots of different things. I wanted to see. Those were not ostriches, they were just more wildebeest. Oh dear. They are quite far away, I'll forgive myself this time. But uh, Philip, yes, so they do travel, they can travel quite far. I've stayed with these five boys overnight before, and um, we found them near the Ashnell Road, which is probably about mm, seven or eight, maybe even close to ten kilometers from, from where we are now. And they only stopped moving at about 1 a.m., and that was further than where we are now. So they covered probably 10, 12 kilometers. Um, they obviously don't walk in a straight line. Um, they move a little bit. Oh, there we go. D'Artagnan's popped his head up. And down again. Uh, so uh, they do. They can move at big distances, and it all depends if they lions in the area. Do they feel threatened? Are they on a scent marking patrol? Now they will hunt just after dark. It's very unusual outside of the full moon nights for them to hunt in the the complete dark. But stranger things have happened. Now, we're going to play a little game. But since we are going to be playing the patience game with these cheetah, so I have got some questions for you. And since we're sitting with the cheetah, I think the questions will be cheetah-based for now. And we'll start off with an easy one. And I think a lot of you will know it. So if you don't, if you do know it, give give the people who might not be as sharp as you a chance to possibly get through there and get an answer and um, I'm going to ask about where the original name actually no I'm making it harder I've decided that was way too easy I want to know if you know about the scientific name of the word of the cheetah what is the scientific meaning Oh, sorry, what is the normal meaning of the scientific name for the cheetah? The cheetah is Aceonyx jubatus. Aceonyx jubatus. So who can tell me what that means? Hashtag Safari Live. I'd like to hear from you if you can tell me what Aceonyx jubatus means. I think... And not using Google. That's cheating. You have to actually know it. If you don't know it... And I'll tell you just now. But as I said, a patience game here. Oh, we might get lucky with some birds, but this, it's very windy. Oh, there we go. Right close to us here. Jahawi. What have we got there, actually? just You see it right on the edge of the bush, the closest, sort of biggest bush sticking out. There we go. You got it a little bit up. Ah, oh, I see what it is. It's a, it's a, fis a, a fiscal shrike. There we go. Not a greyback fiscal, just a normal fiscal. We don't really see them too often in this area. Normally, we tend to see a lot more grey-backed fiscals in this area. So there's a nice little surprise. Oh, here comes another one. About to land in the same spot, nearly. Oh, chase each other around. Oh, they had disappeared. Hello, Ellie Belly. 
um, anybody wants to know whether a cheetah will hunt an elephant. Most definitely not. Not even a baby. Um, they're far too slight. They would, they would injure themselves. There's, they, they would not. Just There's never been a recorded case because they wouldn't hunt an elephant. So no, they wouldn't. Uh, lions, maybe. Leopard, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe a very small elephant that's all by itself but i think even a leopard would struggle with a baby elephant i mean remember a baby elephant's 100 kilograms at birth so i mean it's a massive animal and it's big heavier than me when it's born oh well cheetah have going properly flat at the moment So while we continue to play our patience game, let's hope Jamie has some luck with the other spotted cat of the Mara back on the tr in the triangle. I hope so. The good news is that the signal where I've just the instructions I got and where I understood that it was, I thought it was up against the escarpment. I was wrong. It's right in the middle here, so signal will be perfect. I'm actually, have you a question for our, our viewers who have been watching for many years? Have you ever seen a leopard giraffe kill? Has that ever been on the live safaris? A giraffe up a tree, a hoisted giraffe? I'm very curious to know. You know how to get hold of us, hashtag safari live on Twitter. Let me know if you've ever seen a giraffe kill before. No, a giraffe leopard kill before. I know you've seen giraffe kills, I'm sure you have. When I was, the place that I used to work at before, the lions killed a giraffe right outside our camp and the smell was appalling for days. It was utterly atrocious, but it did make for fun sightings because, you know, get up, roll out of bed, get in the car, go straight to the lions. Easy game. Now on to a different subject entirely. Mia is wondering about the number of grass species that there are in the Maasai Mara. I don't know if there's a species list. There must be. Um, I'll have to try and get hold of one for you. I could tell you that there could easily be 30, 40 grass species around here. So the predominant one, as you will know, is the red oat grass, which I will grab a... I'll, oh, hello. I'll grab a strand for you. I think I drive everybody here mad because I meander. I mean, I stay on one part of the road. I don't do this, but I do meander. I don't go very fast all that often. So I don't know the exact number, but I'll grab some red grass for you or red oat grass as it's known here. I've seen lots of species of panicum grass, which is um, buffalo, buffalo grass. I've seen red top, Natal red top which is a really beautiful grass that you often find on roadsides because it grows in disturbed soils and essentially ah oh, he's heard about the the leopard as well uh, hence the rush i shall follow you mister perhaps you know the directions better than i do pretty sure we'll find a giraffe in a tree though so red top it's got a very soft bright red seed it's very pretty i've seen lots of different types of signal grass erogrosta species the love grass species so this eh, eh, oh, i'm not long enough <laughs> uh, um, okay so this is red grass over here this is what drives the wildebeest to travel here all the way from Tanzania that is the red grass so they come all the way from Tanzania when the red grass is at its height and it will grow up to two meters tall or at least a meter and a half this entire place disappears beneath fields and fields and fields of red grass exceptionally good quality grazing so in a place like South Africa, when you're trying to find something like a white rhino, for example, or an, a, a grazing animal, you go and you look for them around the red grass plains, because that's where they like to be. Thamida triandra is its Latin. As for the number of species, I, 
I'm guessing at 30 to 40 but it's a guess it could be it could be even more because remember you get grass species in the in the swamps Phragmite species yeah I'm not sure exactly how many species of grass you get I wonder if there is there must be a checklist for tourists who are tired of ticking off big babble sightings and they've done all the birds not that you could ever do all the birds done most of the birds and they've decided now they want to check off grass species they're really fun at parties those sorts of people I mean that genuinely see like I haven't seen any invasive grass species the biggest problem that you find in this part of the world is you won't really see it here in the Mara but is within the the water systems is water hyacinth and it's hyacinth that's been brought in from North America not sort of North America I'm sorry South America uh, where it was decided it looked pretty and it went into somebody's pond or something like that and it, it clogs up waterways in the most shocking manner because it's very very potent it reproduces it's very hardy and it blocks up water systems and you see it clearly in the Nile in on Lake Victoria of course Lake Kenya shares a portion of Lake Victoria with Uganda Tanzania so that is one of the most invasive plant species that you see now in South Africa in those you'll, you'll get it in South Africa as well um, there's also there's another type of plant and if you give me a second its name will come back to me it was growing outside our tent before Brent had a um, a moment of energy and removed all of it from the camp what on earth is it called for goodness sake it'll come to me for some reason all I can think of is Lipia and it's not Lipia it's just because we have a Lipia plant growing outside our tent as well ah faith Brent will tell you what it is that I'm trying to think of it's going to drive me mad it is oh it's one of the biggest plant families I'm gonna kick myself but that's another thing that we look out for in South Africa prickly pear for some reason people decided prickly pear was a pretty plant if they insist and it's a devil to remove it really is it's an absolute nightmare I've done a lot of work removing invasive plants in the past water weeds are a nightmare but prickly pear is the worst because you've got to get right down to the roots you've got to pull it up and then you've got to burn it and it doesn't want to burn because lo and behold it's a succulent right oh the road's gonna take me right there I see trees oh I do see the giraffe cool don't worry we're getting there we're getting there okay so Brent is saying there's lots of invasive grass grass species within Kenya and the one that he knows of is the Kikuyu grass species I was sort of I, I, I understand the lawn type species of grass that have then spread what I meant was sorry faith I meant a, there's a plant that grows in camp it's not a grass it's a plant with flowers and it's invasive and it's driving me to distraction I wonder if this leopard didn't pick up the scraps or scavenge this giraffe let's go find out thanks faith So this male hangs around here or has been hanging around here the whole time and I've never seen him that is ridiculous the amount of time I've spent in this area driving around at night and I haven't once seen this leopard and he must be quite relaxed 
Okay, well, we get into position for our leopard sighting and our giraffe up a tree. Exciting. Let's go across to Brent so that he can put my mind at ease as to what the plant is. <laughs> so, guys, oh, there we go. My teacher are up. I'm, I'm not quite sure what plant Jamie's talking about. I, I'm not sure whether I'm getting the right information, but um, is it a grass? Is it a plant? Does it grow near water? Uh, and there, there are many, there probably, Lantana is, if it's a camp in the morrow with bright, bright flowers, possibly Lantana camara, let's see if I'm right on that one, um, it's highly noxious, it actually kills a lot of um, domestic livestock if they eat, eat the, the, the leaves. Uh, they tend to show rabies-like symptoms when they feed off lantana. So frothing at the mouth. Ah, there we go. That's the one. Okay, we figured it out. It's lantana. So it's 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 very very pretty, and it's and it was brought to Africa as an ornamental garden plant, and it makes a very good hedge. However, it is very very bad, and it tends to take over areas. Um, it it likes quite moist areas, so we get a lot of rain or around rivers. It can clog up the banks of streams, and it, it can be it can be a very big problem. But the other problem is it's highly highly noxious, both to human beings and and to most animals. The only thing that absolutely I love it, and it's one of the reasons it's been spread so prod prodigiously throughout Africa, is the fruits are are not dangerous to birds and they find them very tasty so they uh, they spread spread the lantana all over the place now a lot of you actually might have even seen it in gardens in the states it's so it's there's different types of lantana um, there are indigenous types of lantana as well uh, we have an indigenous type of lantana that grows both here and and in uh, and in, in, in South Africa, called Lantana rugosa, um, which is very tasty. Actually, I I eat the fruits. Uh, it is uh, the common name for it is bird's brandy. So birds also like uh, those plants. But I'm just going to try find you a picture of. Well, we get a couple of different types of lantana. Then there we go. And the one that's most commonly used as a hedge. Now, the same species can have different color flowers. Now, Sinak wanted to see a picture of Lantana, and a lot of you might recognize it. There we go. And we just try, how's that there, John? So it's very bright out in the Mara today. Is that working? A bit too glary. There we go. So that's one of the color forms. That's the red and orange color form of lantana. The the more the more common one that we get in Africa. Sorry, Jar, for a second. I'm just going to try get the other 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 color formation um, is slightly paler. And now it's as you can see, it's a very beautiful plant. So there we go. That's that's the more common color form we get. Um, we get our chair. You do get the red and orange one. I actually saw quite a bit of it in Uganda. Um, so. That's the, 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 the more common color formation we get here. And as I said, highly, highly noxious. Uh, very, very dangerous to small children, domestic animals. And, uh, and it can, if you don't know what you're doing with plants, it can be very easily confused for, of course, the, the indigenous lantana. Um, the indigenous lantana isn't as brightly colored. It's sort of pinky and white. And that is lantana rugosa. Let me see, rugosa. Um, and uh, let's see if I can find a, here we go, a picture of that, there we go, okay, I got it now. So you can see it does, the flowers don't occur and in, oh, sorry, one thing, there we go, try to get the color there, in as big a clumps, um, and it's pale, sort of pinky and white, and the fruits are black when they're ripe, almost, uh, but they also don't occur in as big a bunches, and it's a much smaller plant than a Kamara, which uh, grows into hedges, and this this is a, almost always a standalone little plant. Butterflies absolutely love it um, um, when it's flowering, so it's always a good spot to look, especially for some of the smaller butterfly species like the blues, so uh, very interesting stuff, but there we go. Who would have known we could have talked so much about lantana? Uh, and uh, I've actually seen it used all over all over Africa as as a as a hedge. 
Ooh, well, we're going to sit here and wait for these lazy musketeers to get up to something. But Jamie seems to have found something that has expired. Very much expired and in fact partially digested. We found the giraffe, or at least what's left of the giraffe, and it was most definitely a very tiny youngster which would explain how the leopard managed to catch it and how the leopard managed to kill it. So a tiny, tiny little giraffe, there you go, you've got a bit of a perspective as to how tiny it looks dangling in that massive tree. Tiny giraffe, no leopard that I can see. Oh, hello. I'll take a picture of you too if you want. Um, so I don't know where the leopard is. I've checked up at the top of the tree I've checked up in the top of the tree. I can't see anything up there. The leopards here do tend to hide right up in the dense vegetation. Um, they they really do. They they tuck themselves away in a way that I've never seen on Juma because of course our leopards like to be in marula trees which are nice and open whereas these shepherd's trees provide a very dense cover and a dense crown. Uh, so where is the leopard? It's here somewhere. We're going to find it. It's still got a bit of giraffe left. I mean, everybody knows the legs are the best part. Yes, Francis in Israel, it absolutely was a single leopard that managed to catch and kill this giraffe. Coordinated hunting within leopards is very, very rare. There are situations where a male and a female might be mating, they're hungry, an opportunity presents itself, and they sort of cooperate together to take something and catch something, and then they'll share it. Um, or else, perhaps a, a female with all the cubs. That's not it, is it? Hold on. No, it's leaves. It's leaves, I'm sorry. Sorry, it's leopard leaves. Leopard leaves. Um, Leopard with a female with cubs might coordinate or at least she'll catch something and then the cubs will take over as we've seen Karula do in the past. So that's essentially the only time that you will get cooperative hunting between leopards. They're really not very good at it. They're not geared towards being social cats. Even when they're mating, you can see that they resent being in each other's company and they'd actually really rather be alone and separate. And sometimes you even see it with the females and their cubs. Jumbo, you can come, it's fine. I don't know where the... I'm not sure where the leopard is. I don't know where the leopard is. The leopard. I don't know. Oh, that makes sense. On that side. Okay, so I'll go, go ahead. I'm sorry, Faith, I, I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> He's just chatting to this guy. Enjoy! Um, Teresa, you were saying did, did Mbula tree a giraffe calf in the recent past? Possibly. Quite possibly. I think... Didn't he lose it? Did I, Or am I getting confused with sightings? I know he lost a kill to a Birmingham boy at some point. Um, so I'm not sure if it was that giraffe carcass or I, I, honestly uh, there's times where I'm not on social media so I'm not really kept up completely in the loop as to the different sightings but yes entirely possible that Mbula did have a giraffe kill up in a tree so apparently the leopard's on the other side near the bushes uh, can I do you think I should take out a, I wish I had a camera with me I wish I had a camera with me I would so take pic pictures of the people taking pictures of us be very meta. Okay. Sinak, yes, absolutely. Um, oh, they they found it. Okay, I'm going to move as well. Uh, giraffe absolutely are more vulnerable to predators when drinking water, but that's why they're so cautious when they do it. You watch them when they approach water. You can often take. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you think if I? If I go really close to them, their lenses won't be will be too long for them to take a picture of me. Hi guys. Um, so Sinak, yes, absolutely. A giraffe is more vulnerable with their legs spread out like that. It's very difficult for them to get up in a hurry. 
I wonder. Can't see the head anywhere. I wonder if this leopard scavenged a baby giraffe. It's possible. Leopards do scavenge. Either way, it would have made a very good meal. Okay, let's go see the leopard. So, when you watch a giraffe drink, you'll notice that they don't keep their heads down for very long. That makes sense. Total sense, if you think about it. First of all, because they've got so many different adaptions within their bodies to be able to pump blood to their brains all the way up against gravity and keep it there and not and not pass out from loss of blood. He's right. Um, you are in my way. Ali, um, yes, essentially leopards are the only cats that hoist their kills. I say essentially because I've seen caracals up a tree. I've seen caracals up a tree with a with a bird that they've killed, but I don't really know if that would count as hoisting. But they are leopards are the ones that are especially adapted to do it. They've got the just wait until this guy turns his engine off. I see you. You are very much asleep. Okay, you just wait here, guys. We'll just wait our turn. Can you see it there? If you zoom in right into the middle of those bushes, okay, and down a bit and to the right, there, it's in there. Okay, no, you, you definitely can't see it there. Wait, go, sorry, just go a little bit to the left there, Adrian. There, go zoom in in there, into that gap there. Okay, so the leopard's in there. You can just, just see the sun reflecting off its coat on the bottom right part of your screen, hidden between the, the leaves over there. This is why leopards are so good at camouflage. Now we're talking about hoisting kills. A baby giraffe of that size, probably at a time of death, would have weighed around about 100 kilograms. No, maybe a little bit less, but most likely around about 100 kilograms. But yes, the leopard probably would have disemboweled it, for, and it probably would have eaten away some of the organs and pot possibly some of the meat, so it would be a bit lighter. That's it over there, believe it or not. That's the leopard. How exciting is this? A proper Mara leopard sighting. Okay, admittedly, we can only see two inches of skin, but that's okay. Um, but imagine... A, this male leopard, I don't know how big he is, I can't see him, but imagine pulling up your own body weight using your fingernails and your teeth. Imagine picking up something your own body weight and climbing up a tree, doing that. Kathy, how would the leopard have killed the baby giraffe? Um, in the usual way. Mom is very defensive when she's around, but female giraffe often leave their offspring quite, they, they often move quite far away from them. And the leopard would have snuck up and it would have stalked, jumped. As soon as the baby's head went down, it would have been over and then it would have strangled it. This is very, I'm sorry, this isn't the best view, but we just have to be patient. We all have to wait our turn and our turn is yet to come. So we're just going to patiently, patiently wait. I don't want to, I don't know this leopard, I don't know how skittish it is, so I really don't want to be in a, in a position where it feels crowded or unsafe, because that would be terrible if it then got up and ran away. So we just sort of have to patiently sit with it and wait. And there's nothing I can really do now, at all. There's nowhere I can really go. We can have another look at the giraffe, I suppose. completely hidden. Cool. While well, we wait for our spot to view the leopard and quite possibly for the leopard to come out once it gets a bit cooler, let's go back across to Brent on the other side of the river who's got a spotted cat of a different kind.
Well, we've got a spotted cat. We also will notice some vehicles around that also come to enjoy this cheetah sighting. So um, you can see they're, they're all there. The cats are pretty flat. So let's go have a chat and I'm going to have a little wander away from here as well. Uh, we're going to do a, a loop around, see what's about. And um, we will come back and I'll keep an eye to see if the cheetah move. Okay, so I still haven't got any answers for what the scientific name of a cheetah means. Remember, Asiata, Asionix jubatus. I'm sure someone out there must know the answer. If you missed that question a bit earlier, you're joining the drive a little bit best. If you know the answer, hashtag Safari Live. Oh, and for the birders, a little crowned lapwing. Hello, crowned lapwing. I'm not being very noisy just yet. Now, we saw two new bird species, um, I think, for a lot of people this morning. Uh, one was the grey capped social weaver, which is a very cool little bird, uh, and the other was the Caspian plover. Now, don't think I'm going to find a grey capped social weaver around here, but I might be able to get you a better view of the Caspian plovers. They were sitting up on these ridges in quite big flocks. Oh, there we go. What have we there? Oh, it just disappeared. Just behind this little round clumpy there jar that looked like quite an interesting bird could we be adding a third new bird species for the day if it doesn't start hiding from me where's it gone i don't think that's it but there's another bird sitting up high there Tricky one. Let's have a look. That is a very tricky one. I might have to take a moment. So I said it looked very interesting to me. It looked like something I hadn't seen before uh, in this part of the Mara, but I'm pretty sure I know who it is. Look at that very distinct little head bob that they do. Now, it's one of two families. I'm just going to check something quickly. Uh, please go again with that. Question their faith. Now, oh, it's not what I thought it was. Oh, this is exciting. See, it's very upright. Um, very, very upright. And I thought it might be. I'm trying to double check. Oh, where'd it go? You can still hear it. You got him again? There we go. So very, very upright posture. You see the very distinct white eye stripe. A very pale belly. That is a very cool bird. Guys, this is definitely going to be a, a new bird for a lot of you. Um, I'm just going to make sure. I need to see its tail a bit better. So look like it's got white is it white edges to the tail or black is that the wings that are folding over oh well, there we go that thank you <laughs> a very very oh off we went very distinct white rump i'm just going to check my other app quickly as well um because sometimes some of the apps the pictures can be a little bit different but i'm pretty sure i know what it is 
my app doesn't seem to agree with me. <laughs> that happens from time to time. Of course, I'm right and the app's wrong. Have you still got it? There we go. I'm just trying to... There we go. So I'm just trying to see if I've got any photographs of it. No. Okay, it's not what I thought it was initially. Oh, what are you? What are you? No, you have to be. I, I'm, I'm convinced it's a wheat ear of sorts, but which wheat ear is what I'm trying to figure out at the moment. So, let me go back to the East African app. Tony says it looks like a female version of a something colorful. Colorful, sorry. Um, well, <laughs> uh, I'm not. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, goodness. Could it be? Oh, it's gone again. Birds. Oh, it's coming back. Where is it off to now? So, just the way it sits and uh, its general movements remind me very much of a wheat ear but I'm, I'm not finding a wheat ear that sort of fits the bill which is the problem um, maybe it's one of the migratory wheat ears and I think I just need to see nope, the other pictures if it has more pictures let's, I'm going to check the other app again um, quickly, but see, this is the fun thing about birding. You never know what you're going to find. Now, I wasn't expecting to get any really good birds um, right up here. I was expecting to, you know, see some Caspian plovers, maybe. Um, hang on a second. There we go. There we go. Wheat ears. So I'm just checking the other app. Sometimes um, they have different pictures. No, I didn't get the comms. Okay, okay, well, I try to figure out what bird this is. Let's go back across to Jamie. Oh, I'm excited to hear what a particular bird Brent has found for all of you. So while he puzzles that out, we've managed to puzzle our way around the bush and we found the best possible view. So there's our dangly giraffe and in the position that we're in, we can just, just see the leopard. There he is hiding there, a puddle of spots. It gives you a really, it gives you a very good idea as to just how well the camouflage of a leopard works. So he's hiding out there, he's fast asleep, and you can, you can believe it, given that he has an entire belly full of giraffe. He looks huge, from what I can see, well, I mean, at least he looks to be a big male, fully grown male Tom. Male Tom. Goodness, I've been doing that all day. Female lionesses, male Toms. You know what I mean. And you can see breathing quite rapidly because he's hot and his belly is full. And for when predators gorge themselves in the way that they do, they get very, very full, very round bellies. And the digestion process of all of that meat, all of that protein, releases an enormous amount of heat within the, the leopard itself, which is why they get, why, in the predator itself, which is why they get very hot and why they pant when they've just eaten. Now I am going to have to at some point move away so that the other people can take this position because it is the only place where you can see this leopard. I can tell you that he's very relaxed though because we're actually, I was watching him the whole time and we've managed to get close up without a reaction, not even a head lift from him. So he's as relaxed as one of our Sabi sand leopard. So what we'll do, I think, is we'll give up our position, stay for another few minutes, see what he does, and then we'll probably go for a short drive, loop around, find some other stuff to show you, and then come back. Hopefully in time for him to get up and come and finish off the rest of that giraffe. There's not much left, so I don't think he's going to be here tomorrow morning. Mm. 
suited dragon no um, um, yes potentially if a, if a tiny baby newborn elephant were to for some reason be abandoned if if its mum had perhaps died during the labor process and it didn't have the support of the rest of the herd yes a big male leopard could potentially kill a newborn elephant the chances of that happening though are totally totally remote and chances are the leopard's not even going to take that risk because the Elephants will be so phenomenally defensive. When you've got situations where an elephant is killed by a predator, it's a social predator. It's either hyenas or it's lions. And hyenas would be the biggest risk for a newborn elephant. They've got such a potent sense of smell. They're also more active during the times of the day when the lions might be asleep. But essentially, those are the, those are the only real threats to a newborn baby elephant. And even then, that mother is so protective and so aware and so large that that's why it needs to be a social predator because they need to have the numbers to be able to distract the mother and for then the rest of them to move in and catch the baby elephant it's rare it doesn't often happen at all and i don't think there are many cases of a leopard actually catching a baby elephant if indeed there are any cases of a, the circumstances would stances would have to be so specific to that situation and mom would have to be out of the equation for whatever reason. Leopards, I mean a big male leopard can focus on baby buffalo, they can catch and kill baby buffalo, it does happen. Baby giraffe, most of the time they'll go for larger antelope species. Uh, a leopard his size could probably catch a topi. <coughs> but never underestimate leopards because pound for pound they are the most powerful predator. They are so strong and so fast. Tandi, for example, who is a female leopard on Juma and the daughter of Karula, she killed three male impala in one go once. Not, in, not exactly one time, but she had three male impala kills and she killed an adult female waterbuck. So they, I mean, that would be an antelope that is easily double her weight, if not more. So they are capable of punching, a, punching above their weight, so to speak but they do it cautiously and they're naturally cautious, careful animals. In terms of, of threats to livestock, and a leopard is probably the biggest threat because they do tend to range. They do often move into areas where people are. They are sneaky, they're lithe, and they're subtle. And as a result, they're often responsible for taking things like goats or sheep and potentially even small children, although it's rare. Dogs, cats also get taken by leopards. Okay, if you're all happy, we're going to leave this leopard for now, make some space for the other guests so that they can come and see exactly what it is that the leopard, or at least have a chance to see the leopard, will come back when it reaches evening time. Now, I didn't quite hear what it was that, that leopard, <laughs> that leopard, that Brent was going to show you, but let's go across and he can tell you himself. Well, we went from one wheat ear that we took a bit of a time to figure out which one it was to a wheat ear that's very recognizable. That is a capped wheat ear, uh, very, very distinct uh, with the black around the throat, or the white throat with the black breast. So that is a capped wheat ear sitting on a retired wildebeest. Very, very pretty bird. Now, that other bird, as I said, it, 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 it screamed wheat ear to me. And the reason I did not know it is because it was a bird I'd never seen before. So, very exciting for me. That last bird um, was indeed a female northern wheat ear. And I think it was Joy who was spot on with that as well. So, I think Joy and I came to that conclusion at about the same time. So, a very well done to Joy um, for that I'm just going to turn the car so there's not so much glare, so I can show you the northern wheat here. How's that? That should be a bit better there. So, here we go, a northern wheat here. So, that's the female. We saw a female. You can see the male is a bit more pretty. but. This is why I'd like to jump around sometimes uh, in, in the apps, and I'm going to show you right now. Um, no, don't want to 
have I done? Um, if you look at the different, sometimes the different um, pictures are quite distinct. So you can see this, this, this one was far more like the one we saw. Um, and then th with this app, you also get a few pictures and then you go, you can see the female and the male together there. So very, very, very cool. That is a new bird species for me. And now that does not happen every day. So I'm very, very excited. And you can see they're migrants. They come to this area um, between September and April. And you can see this photo was actually taken in Kazakhstan. There we go. So they, they, they might have, that, that bird might have come from one of the stands. It's not something you say every day, you know. I saw a bird today that came from Kazakhstan. Okay, let's move on. Oh, there's a big bird. <laughs> Before we move on, a very big bird. Oh, it sounds like we have some answers for the cheetah quiz. Well done, Anna. The Asionix part means non-moving or stationary claw. Um, and uh, the Jubatus part means maned. So when they are cubs, they've got that very prominent crest that sticks up. That looks very much like grass. And uh, there are only four species of cat in the world uh, that have semi-retractable claws like the cheetah. The cheetah is by far the biggest and the only African species of cat. Now a very sad little fact about all of those cats is they are highly highly endangered. Um, one is the fishing cat and of course if you're using your claws to hook fish out of the water probably don't want them to slide all the way back in. And uh, all, the, all the other cat species, the other cat species that have semi-retractable claws, all from Southeast Asia um, and Asia. So there's one, oh, I can't remember its name now. Uh, I, 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 something. It occurs only on one island in Japan, one tiny island, and they think there's less than 150 of them left. So very, very sad. Um, and but all, all, all of those cats with the, the retract, semi-retractable claws are all highly endangered, which is a, a bit of a sad. Um, a sad thing. Now, believe it or not, the cheetah are by far the least endangered of all those cats. Are we going to play chicken? No, we're not. We'll pull off the road. How are you? Safi, Safi. Yatano. Moja, ka moja. Now, you'll see the guard is there. No, very good. Yeah, we're live at the moment, so we're going to carry on. I'll see you back at the cheetah a little bit later. So, guys, we're going to carry on, see what else we can find. Uh, sorry, can you go again with that question, please? Aha! Uh -huh. Some more birdies. Oh, actually, I'm going to go so we can get more than one species. Okay, so we've got a lapwing here next to us. Now, you've got to be very careful with these little lapwings in the Mara because there are two that look very, very similar. Now, one is the same as what we get back in South Africa, and um, it is called the Senegal lapwing. But here we have another lapwing that looks very, very similar to the Senegal lapwing. Oh, hang on, I was fighting some flies. There we go, you can see they do love the short grasses, like the Senegal lapwing, which they don't call a Senegal lapwing in, um, <laughs> in, uh, in East Africa, just to confuse matters. And just give me one second here. And they do call it a Senegal lapwing. Oh, jahami has got two birds in the shot. Where? Oh, I didn't see the other one. It's a bit of glare on my monitor. Ah, a Rufus Nape lark. Look at him. He's got his little Rufus Nape up. Isn't he sweet? Hello, little Rufus. Oh, you've got some bugs there as well. That's pretty cool. Oh, no, we don't. Now we're playing 
there we go, a black wing, lap wing call, just to confuse matters. So I just wanted to have a quick closer look at them before. The call, what I, I'm going to use my binos, there's a bit too much glare on my monitor. Now we're looking at the eye colour and very specifically on on, on on these birds. Now remember this is coming to you 100% live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya. So you can see reddish legs and um, a very distinct sort of almost reddish uh, section around the eye. Now that would mean it is not the Senegal lapwing. So this might be a new bird species for a lot of our viewers out there. Um, it is of course the black winged lapwing. So um, and it is some immature birds, none of them are adults. Um, when they're adults, they're a little bit easier to, to identify, but these look like, like some immature black winged lapwings. So it's the red around the eye and the red on the legs with the Senegal lax, but we do get both species here. Okay, what is that running there? Is that a Grant's gazelle in the distance? Or is it just a Tommy? Is it Tommy? No, there's a Grant's there. Are you getting those comms? Very, very low. Okay, I'm just gonna try to fix something here quickly. May I have some duct tape, please? Let's try the old fix everything. If duct tape doesn't work, we go with a cable tie. Faith, you can try to talk to me again, please. Sinak Sinak is wondering what animals and birds that live in the Mara have I not seen that do live here? Well, there's one I have seen it before, but not this time, so it doesn't count. Um, called well, from the mammal point of view, the one that I'm most keen to see is striped hyena. Just because they're really cool, um, uh, but. I'm trying to think from another mammal. One thing I've actually found quite strange that none of us have seen a honey badger um, since we've been in the Mara. Joe, have you ever seen a honey badger in the Mara? No. So that's that's one, and especially with the amount of time we spend out day and night, I think that's quite unusual that we haven't seen a honey badger. Um, birds, uh, there's plenty. Now, one of the cooler birds that I have heard but haven't seen in the Mara is... Uh, Hello, is of course um, the Pell's Fishing Owl, which we've I've heard along the Mara River. They got a wonderful deep booming call, but I haven't managed to spot them just yet. It's very difficult to get into the trees on the Mara there. But okay, moving on again. So this is fun. We're just going to take check carefully every little bird that scurries past. We're going to inspect. I mean, we've seen two wheat ears already today. Is that the missing cast? There we go. The bird that I came up here to look for, it looks like. There's a little flock of them. It is them. It's Caspian plovers. All walking around on the ground. So uh, there we go, some Caspian plovers. Now we did see them this morning, but I know it wasn't the best view. So at this time of the year, they can be very, very sort of, well, they're not migratory, sort of nomadic is a better word. I think I used migratory this morning, which is probably a little bit incorrect. Um, nomadic is, a, is probably a much better description. And, uh, so between August and May, you can get very big flocks of, ca of Caspian plovers uh, on the short open grasslands. But uh, during the breeding season, they will move closer to uh, water areas. So it, it, is, it is quite nice to see them. So we will be seeing quite a few more of them out here. So I'm, I've seen flocks of over 100 so far. Okay, off we move. Well, see, we came looking for Caspian plovers and we came away with capped wheat ear and
and a northern wheat ear, which is a new bird species for me. Goes to show, just always look carefully while out here. So I didn't think the birding was going to be so grand up here. So I'm swatting flies. Uh, Cenac's got another question through um, on what lapwing species do we find in the Mara? Okay, Senegal, black winged, blacksmith, Egyptian, wattled, crowned. I think that's all of them, six of them. I'll double check for you, Cenac. But uh, I'm pretty sure that's all the lapwing species we get in the Mara. So we get wattled lapwing, yes, check. Black winged lapwing, check. Blacksmith, check. Uh, crowned, check. Long toed, we haven't seen long toed, so seven, but they'll be along the river. Senegal, check. Spur winged, check. And that's that. So seven lapwing species in the Mara. They do like short grasses and moist areas, and this has got plenty of both. So there's a little water hole coming up. I'm going to see if we can find any little water birds around there while we wait for those lazy cheetah to get moving. But while we, while we do that, uh, Jamie's all the way on the other side of the river with one of her favorite animals. Lots of my favorite animals and I'll tell you about my answer to what I would like to see still in the Mara in a moment. But first, isn't this stunning? There are so many elephants. They are just absolutely everywhere. It's special. I, I really feel, I don't know where they've all come from. I don't know why they've all gathered around this area, but I really feel like there are more elephants here than I've ever seen in the Mara. Big ones, small ones, that tiny one over there that's standing in mom's shade. Look at that. Having a little rest in mom's shade. Can you see it there? There we go. There we go. <laughs> Faith says maybe they're migrating. The great elephant migration. Look, I mean, elephants do move with resources. And perhaps once all of the wildebeest are gone and after the rains, they know that the grass is going to start growing. The seeds are going to start sprouting. And perhaps it does bring them to an area like this. I don't know. But it really does feel like there are more elephants than I've ever seen. Perhaps it's just one of those random movements of nature that all of a sudden we've got lots. But let's, if you don't mind, Adrian, if we can start all the way on the left. Let's see. Let's start all the way on the left over there with those elephants at the back. I'm not going to try and do an entirely accurate count. But if we start with those eddies there and we do a bit of a head count. So let's just do a slow pan across to the right and just see how many eddies there are. Nine-ish. And if we keep going, there's number 10, there's 11, there's 12, there's 13. There's a large open space. <laughs> There's Serena. There's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38. And then... I've lost track. Wait, was that, this diff was that a different group? Yes. That's a different group, okay. So 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52. And if we go a little bit further, we've got 53 hiding behind a tree. <laughs> and 54, 55, 56, tiny one in the shade. 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66. 67, 68, 
Are we out of elephants? We seem to be out of elephants. 68 elephants in one sighting. None of them are very close and we will get to, we will try and get a little bit closer as we go along. But it's now, I, I mentioned yesterday that I, oh, was it this morning? I think it was this morning. I mentioned yesterday I thought I'd seen a hundred elephants on my drive through to where the cheetah with the cubs was. And I don't think I was exaggerating because you just see, you just find scenes like this absolutely everywhere. And I love it. It's one of my absolute favorite things about being in the Mara. I know that wasn't an entirely accurate count, by the way. Before I am pilloried, I'm aware. Let's round up and say 70. How's that? 75. If we're feeling, re if you really doubt my counting skills, which would be fair. I sneakily had a little piece of cake before we left this afternoon, and it's so rattly. I don't think I'm on a road. I have to tell you, I think I'm on an old off-road track. Daniel, Daniel, no, elephants do not get culled in the Mara. There are few places where elephants do still get culled. Up until quite recently, in terms, well, I'm, oh, hello, what's wrong? What's wrong? You can see these youngsters are anxious. You can immediately see it with their tails. The way that they're moving. Well, the fact that they're running is also a dead giveaway. But stiff tails like that upset elephants. It might just be that the two of them are having a bit of a tussle. Because mom behind looks quite relaxed. Young male, and I think it's another young male as well. Yeah, I think they were just chasing you. Hey, big girl. Hello. Okay. Okay. What's up? What's up? When a female elephant is displaying this sort of body language at this distance, it's time to be on alert. Now we're fine. You often see this body language when an elephant is close to you, but at this sort of distance it's peculiar because we're quite far out of her, her discomfort space or her comfort zone is actually the word I'm looking for. I'm not sorry, I'm not going to take the eye, my eyes off her yet. Hello big girl. What? What? I didn't even do anything. Now the next big question when you're assessing a situation like this is, is it a male or is it a female? All of the other elephants are calm. Is this in fact a female? And the trick is to then look at her head. Now my initial assessment was female and I'm standing by that looking at the shape of her forehead. And if we look down between her legs, let me see if I can see any sign. No, she's a female. So that immediately changes the situation. A young male that age, or a, a male that would be quite young if it was this size, often displays behavior like this because they're still learning their place in the world and they want to be big and scary. A female doesn't do that unless there's something wrong. And there's something wrong with this female. I don't know why she's so upset. I don't know if she's had a bad experience with a vehicle recently. But I can tell you that this is absolutely as close as we will go with her displaying body language like this at this distance. And if she does decide to move towards us, chances are it will not be... It, it might be a warning charge, it could be a warning charge. And it, that's often termed a mock charge. And there's nothing mocking about it. That's why it's one of the terms that I really dislike when it's used. A mock charge is not a mock charge, it's a warning charge. And people tend to not take it seriously because it's a mock. The animal doesn't mean it, but the animal does mean it. It's telling you something. Now, I don't want to start the vehicle now because I can see she's upset. It's only going to provoke her further. And it's not serious. It's not a serious situation. But these are the sorts of, of lessons that we can teach you all. So if you ever find yourself in a position where you are in a reserve, Joy, that was the first thought that crossed my mind. Um, and that's why I immediately looked at her 
mammary glands as I was talking to you. I also looked at the age of her youngster to try and figure out if she would be around that point. She's not bulging enough for a start. Her mammary glands are not, she's not lactating, she's not full of milk or producing milk. So no, but that was, you, you are, you are not wrong in the sense, hold on, let's just check again at this distance. Let me just have a look between, ah, I've been fooled. I've been fooled. Oh, no wonder you being cheeky. Oh, that changes things completely. It's a boy. It's a boy. That means an entirely different situation. So when a male does that at this age, and you see how deceptive it is with that angular forehead at that age. It's difficult to see, but at, at, at that distance. But that is a male, and that makes a whole lot more sense, because I was a little bit baffled as to that sort of behavior. Okay, now it's just that that changes things completely. It's just a cheeky boy So you see all of that thought process is is something that we're doing almost constantly in every sighting that we're in Whether it's it's assessing the animals behavior the circumstances the positioning of the vehicle all of that and Knowing their behavior dictates how you're going to respond to behavior like that So I'm not worried anymore. I wasn't particularly worried, but I was bemused that a female would be so thoroughly upset with us when everybody else is so calm but a male hormonal young teenager makes complete sense he just wants to show that he's the biggest baddest thing out there that's why the youngsters were running because he was harassing them and that is why he's got it into his head that he's all big and scary nonsense you silly boy you gave me cause for confusion. One of the things I was looking for was an injury. Okay. I, I missed entirely the first part of Faith's link, but it sounds as though Brent is continuing his birding streak for the afternoon. Let's go and join him across the river. There we go, another new bird for the Mara bird list, a red-billed teal. Very pretty little birds. So if you're a birder, a little wetland like this is always a great place to stop. Uh, you can always get a couple of lovely little species like that teal. Now where did that little wood sandpiper go? Oh, he's done a vanishing act. He was around, but of course, more commonly, the Egyptian goose, and we see quite a lot of them, but they're also present grazing on the little green shoots that are coming through um, from the mud. They're very, 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 very common all the way from the Nile Delta in Egypt to the southern tip of Africa and they've actually done very very well and their numbers have increased because they have managed to take advantage of a man-made feature which enables them to have lots of lovely grazing uh, and water and it is of course the golf course and uh, many a greens manager is fighting the war against the Egyptian goose leavings on their manicured greens and I think <laughs> I like it. Oh, what have we got over there? No, that's a false alarm. Um, the teal's coming out into the open a little bit. I just want to have a show show you quickly. Hopefully, he pops his head up. Um, they've got such lovely, lovely colours on the bill. Uh, very, very striking. Obviously, that's where it gets its name, the red billed teal. Oh, he's put his whole head under the water, of course, as soon as I say that. He's swimming. There he goes out in the open again. Coming over to the... He's going to come in. There he is. Look at that. Beautiful little bird. It's also quite a nomadic species, depending on rainfall and water. Joy's wondering, what is the difference between a duck and a teal? Joy, you have me. I think teal's just a small duck. Um, I'm going to have to double check on that one. So I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's just a small duck. Uh, a teal and a duck. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm guessing. There you go. They are very, very pretty, the red bull teal. You 
can see feeding on some aquatic vegetation. Uh, sifting through there, oh, found something tasty underneath that little bit of water grass. See, Joy, you've now made got me really thinking um, because it's not something I've ever thought about, the difference between a teal and a duck. I'm, I'm guessing, and I say I'm guessing, um, it is just a, a small duck. But that's what one of the wonderful things about being on safari is you learn something new every day. So by the end of today, I will know what the difference is between a teal and a duck. Now, James is wondering, is there any bird species that have area-specific breeding plumage? Uh, oh, not really. I mean, you have some area-specific plumage in the, in the paradise um, flycatchers, but I wouldn't say area-specific breeding, uh, breeding plumage to a very small area. Um, so, yeah, in East Africa, you get paradise flycatchers that have uh, you get both the normal paradise flycatcher as well as a black and white morph of the paradise flycatcher. So that, that I suppose is 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 a difference there. I, I don't know if we're going to be able to see that there. That's in the shade. Oh, let me put it. Let me put it. Okay. Sorry about that everyone, Brent's vanished off your, off your screens and you may never discover what the difference between a teal and a duck is, although I'm sure Google will be able to tell you. Adrian um, very kindly answered for Brent, he says it's the spelling, which you can't really contest, can you? Alright, so I'm, try I'm trying to find a way to get closer to the Ellies without off-roading, um, just because I'm actually not 100% sure if we can off-road for elephants here. This is an off-roading area, but I'm not sure if we can, and I don't really want to break the rule without knowing. Uh, I'm looking to see if there's a road that will take me where I want to go, but I confess it's not, it's not happening. It is hot today for the Mara. For the Mara, it's hot. The sun is very strong, and all of that mud, all of that water, that was here a few days ago is gone. This place is like a sponge. I wonder where this road's going to take me. Um, <laughs> David, I'm sorry, I'm giggling and I'll try and explain it in a, in a family friendly way in a moment. Um, David, you want to know what the most unusual animal carcass is that I've ever seen in a tree? I've seen a porcupine in a tree, that was quite odd. I've seen a python in a tree, a dead python that had been hoisted and killed by a leopard and hoisted many, many, many years ago. Those would be some of the weirdest things. I missed the aardvark. Apparently, Tingana went through a phase where he really liked to kill and hoist aardvarks. And I, Tingana is a male leopard, by the way, in South Africa, the dominant male leopard. And I just, I think it was just before my time that that particular sighting happened. So I've never seen that before. The reason I had a little chuckle was because many years ago there was a flood. Um, and the river came up and actually ended up wash, washing away one of the camps. I'm not laughing at that, it was actually tragic. But the river came up in a major way and, of course, washed a whole load of, of stuff with it. So we went into the river and we did a massive cleanup. It's quite a dangerous thing to do, so we were walking with rifles ahead, checking for everybody and then getting groups of people in to help clean up. Because you don't, river vegetation is very dense, there's uh, reeds and dips and sandbanks and we actually made a game out of it for our guests. We played bingo and depending on what item you got and everybody got a bingo card and 
it was just a way of, of getting them to be enthusiastic about the whole process. But the strangest thing I ever found in a tree, how am I going to phrase this? It was a, it was a balloon. How do I put this? It was a, it was a balloon that was imitating a nurse in a tree. And um, the person who saw it thought it was just a piece of plastic and went to go and fetch it and immediately retreated several steps going, I'm not touching that! Anyway, eventually we managed to remove it to great hilarity. So that's actually, it's not a carcass, but it's technically the weirdest thing I've ever found in a tree. You, you, put, you piece it together, you'll get what I mean. I assume somebody had a bachelor party somewhere upstream. That's the weirdest thing I've ever found in a tree. Handy Mike forever! The reason that we don't... You do actually occasionally see vultures feeding on a carcass. Left or right, everyone? Hmm. If it's back that way, that way is the main road. Let's go left. Um, you do occasionally, vultures do feed in trees, but it's unusual because they're not particular, they're very heavy birds. Landing and hopping around in a tree is tricky. And you can almost guarantee that when something's being treed, the leopard is going to be somewhere around. And the vultures know that. There are birds that do feed off carcasses in trees often. Tawny eagles and battaliers being the main ones. And they're actually often the culprit in terms of a leopard losing its kill. Because if the leopard goes off and has a drink somewhere, tawny eagle comes in, a battalier comes in, they have a little bit of a battle and they're trying to feed on the carcass. They don't have knives and forks, so it's a messy process and the carcass falls down and the hyena grabs it. So you do see birds feeding off a carcass and in fact, it's one of the ways that we find leopards or one of the ways that we look for leopards. When we see species of birds like tawnies and, and battaliers hanging out in a tree, not really doing much, it's usually worth investigating. It's usually worth going and having a look. But vultures are a bit big and a bit bulky to be able to feed in trees. And they're, they're noisy. A tawny eagle or a battalier can swoop in silently, but a vulture is much flapping and feathers and breaking of branches. They're big, heavy birds. That's why they prefer to roost on trees without leaves rather than leafy trees. They'll still go into leafy trees, but they prefer not to. Oh, okay, um, take care, you've caught me out. So you want to know what the root formation is of the flat-topped trees. Now, I assume we're talking about the ones that we're driving around at the moment. These are all Balanites trees. Different species of Balanites to the one that we get in... So let's have a look at that flat-topped tree just behind there, because it's quite a good example. Balanites tree, different species to the ones that we see in South Africa. The root structure, I'm guessing, is similar to that of a Balanites or torchwood, a green thorn in South Africa, which is, rather than having a tap root, is, is quite an extensive network of roots that go down quite deep. But I'm guessing. I'm actually not 100% sure. There's so much water here, um, and... I'm just trying to think if they would need to somehow secure themselves because of all the rain in muddy, muddy soils. I don't know. It's a good question. I'll try and find, I will find out for you. The acacias that are, you also get flat topped acacias, so umbrella thorns would be a very good example. Now acacia trees often have quite shallow root systems. That's why it's quite dangerous to camp out under a knob thorn which you don't get here, but to camp out under a knob thorn, which the South African team, will, I'm sure, will be kind enough to show you when it's particularly windy or stormy, because knob thorns often are uprooted by those sorts of things. 
They are also nitrogen fixers. In other words, they have special almost bulges on their roots with bacteria that allows them to fix nitrogen. They have a symbiotic relationship that fixes nitrogen in a way that it can be utilized and in a way that is soluble and can be stored. That's about as much as I can tell you about the root system. I confess to not knowing what exactly the root system of a Balanites is. I'm thinking a network rather than a taproot and then but maybe a couple of really, really large roots to anchor it in place. Vida Winter, you are spot on. The, the, the cat is out of the bag, so to speak. James Henry is indeed known for, whoops, that's all, <laughs> known for climbing trees. Um, all of our crew members have in the past climbed a tree. The last time I think I climbed a tree was for the Easter egg hunt last year, so it was quite a while ago. But all of us have been known to climb trees. Fig trees, just by the way, are, well, I say the last time I climbed a tree live. I did climb a massive fig on the other side of the river and it was spectacular. Um, fig trees are the best to climb. Sausage trees aren't bad, but fig trees are most definitely the best. James has done it the most gracefully, I think. Sometimes his descent is, is a tricky one. Brent, I think, is the winner when it comes to ridiculous descents because he fell out of a torchwood. He fell out of the Balanites on Zoe's Road from far up. I think it's in a blooper reel somewhere. But Brent came tumbling out. Okay, as I try and loop towards these elephants, at some point I'm going to find a way to get to them. Let's jump across to Brent, who is still playing the patience game. Let's go and see whether there's any sign of movement from the Cheetah Boys. Here we go, we're back with the cheetah. Still not much movement, although they have moved a little bit further out from under the bush because uh, the shade has moved as the sun carries on. And there's one moved out there. And D'Artagnan's still to the right of that one, but still very much hidden in the bushes. So there has been some tiny bits of movement while we've been away. Not much though. I've got a feeling the boys are going to make us play the patience game with no reward today. They are looking quite full. You can see how big um, how big their bellies are. You can hear the wind howling. You can actually probably see some dust coming through now as one of the vehicles moved. Um, so we're sitting yeah, we just got to position ourselves quite strangely just to make sure that um, we do keep picture. Oh, the wind's decided to come blow dust into my face. Woo wee! That is strong wind today. Uh, see, uh, Jamie's been talking about people falling out of trees, and of course, yes, uh, I, I fell out of a tree uh, from higher than James Henry fell out of the tree. So let's just be clear, James has also fallen, but I fell from much higher. Uh, and of course, I just rolled and laughed because I'm tough like that. But yes, I've, we have fallen out of the odd tree, and we have all climbed trees. And uh, growing up in the, in the bushes, we did. Um, <laughs> we spent a lot of time tree climbing. I think one of my favorite tree climbing stories is I was actually with my dad I was about 14 years old and there's a place called Quena Lagoon which means Crocodile Lagoon on uh, the Kondo River in northern Botswana and uh, there's a massive big jackalberry that sort of leans out of a monster termite mound. The termite mound is about six meters seven meters high it's one of the biggest I've ever seen probably about 15 meters at the base and this big jackalberry sort of leans over this lagoon and, and part of the big branches are down in the water and we saw a herd of about 2,000 buffalo on their way down to drink and we quickly scurried up the tree and we sat there and waited and we had these buffalo all underneath us. Now we saw a little bit of a rollover but not much. Their heads are up more than they were a little bit earlier.
Marcy is wondering what uh, little animals are lurking around that we can't see. Well, I'm sure there's lots of uh, beetles and bugs and the odd mouse and, 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 or gerbil um, that we probably can't see. Yeah. And uh, that's probably about it. Uh, most of the other stuff we, an we can see. Okay, so thanks to a question, I have learnt something today. The difference between a teal and a duck. Um, a teal is a doubling a duck, uh, which means it feels it generally is a shallow water duck. Doesn't like diving. Will pop its head underwater to feed off insects and aquatic grass um, or vegetation, but they don't like diving. Um, and they like shallow water so there we go uh, and generally a little bit smaller than the bigger duck species so there we go a teal is a dabbling duck I don't know what's better teal or dabbling duck I quite like dabbling duck myself not dark wing duck now guys don't get confused a dabbling duck So the temperature's dropped off a few degrees and I am hoping that it might inspire some movement from the musketeers, but I'm not too too hopeful today. Oh, Mario has got a very interesting question. Um, if the musketeers happened to come across a female in estrus, would all of them mate with her? Or would uh, only one or two of them mate with her? Oh, we are getting lots of vehicles coming to enjoy these cheetah at the moment. Uh, Mario, I think it's going to be very interesting to see because they're quite young as a coalition. It's going to be, it'll sort out the dominance quite quickly to see who mates with her. So I don't think we can, we can answer that straight off the bat now there's a uh, so lovely white flowers around here at the moment oh there's a bird we'll go back to the flowers after we find the bird so in that patch of white flowers just to the far left of it there is a little birdie a um, little bit to the left jar and there we go center frame a little bit to the right there we go now what have we here uh, I think I know who you are. Yep. Not doing its prominent calling spot, but we have seen one of them sticking his, his Rufus Nape up a bit earlier. So it is a Rufus Nape lark. But there we go. We can see those, the, those flowers. They're quite often referred to as toilet paper flowers by the guides in the Mara. Of course, that is not their real name. Their real name is a flay ink flower a flay ink flower and they do like uh, wettish areas moist areas so they often explode after the rain there we go not too many now the rain is a little bit old so for those of you who are like the scientific side it's called Cycinium to tuberlosum tuberlosum oof it's quite the mouthful um cycinium tuberlosum so it also makes for very very pretty photographs um when you when you see that lions or, or a cheetah or any animal in particular with the little white dots spreading across the short grass and you won't really find them in in, in long grass you'll only find it in short grass sorry got some dust in my eye there Bit of dust coming the winds coming straight from that that, that direction and the temperatures definitely dropped a bit so that is good news hopefully the cheetah will move i think i'm going to give them another 20 minutes or so um before i start making my way back towards silas and seeing what else we can find on the way there we go well they are looking very flat but we know where to look for them tomorrow morning we're not 
grasping at straws and driving around uh, in the dark but in the light so to speak so let's go back across and see how Jamie's doing on the other side of the Mara I'm very happy I'm always happy when elephants are involved especially little elephants using their trunks and being just thoroughly entertaining I couldn't resist the allure of 70 elephants wandering about so I finally managed to find ourselves a, a road that led us straight in their direction and they are walking towards us so I'm sitting here patiently waiting for them to come a little bit closer and then as it gets cooler I would say in about mm, half an hour or so we'll head back towards that leopard and we'll spend a bit more time with him towards no wait hold on no it's okay uh, what I'll do actually because I've just remembered gate times mm, should take me about half an hour okay no that's fine we'll head after this elephant sighting we'll head back to him and hopefully he's decided to stir himself it's still unusually hot for this time of day it's after five o'clock and I'm still feeling a bit clammy and sweaty and uncomfortable so it really is quite warm I hope the rain comes soon floppy-eared one on the right. Now Ellie Belly, you want to know if any of these are the orphaned elephants that have been reintroduced into the wild? Um, no. no, they wouldn't be. As far as I know, the elephants that are released from the orphanages in this particular country in Kenya are released into other areas including, if I'm not mistaken, Savo. I'm just trying to think. Savo possibly Amboseli, but I think it's Savo. It's a degree of caution is needed when releasing an orphaned elephant back into the wild. First of all, obviously they're social animals and acceptance into a herd is not is not inevitable. In fact, it's actually quite unlikely. So they have to be released together as a group. Then you've got the additional problem of the fact that they, they really like people. People are their friends. They have no fear. They have a, a, a very close familiarity with human beings and vehicles, which makes them potentially dangerous. Because let's say you've got a situation where you've got a young female coming into her first Easter cycle, she's in the wild, and um, a male elephant now wants to mate with her. She, in utter terror, runs to a safe place, which for most wild elephants would be the herd and they would help to comfort her and to sort of relax her through that whole process but with a an orphan and released elephant would then come running to protectors which in in its mind would be in her mind would be human beings so it's a tricky one releasing an orphaned elephant has to be done very very cautiously once they're ready to to be out on their own and it has to be released into an area where people are aware and know how to handle it and i think uh, uh, could be wrong but I don't think any have been released into that into the Mara for that exact reason there are lots of self-drive vehicles around here and the potential for an accident is is there what is that little baby doing are you having a little snooze You're having a little rest on a termite mound like a puppy with your legs curled over that way <laughs> how sweet Oh, I I really should have explained that earlier. Let's just wait for let's just wait for one second. Sorry, Adrian. I'm I know that we've we've got a question about it, but let's just watch this baby elephant get up over the termite mound because it's quite entertaining, and then I'll get to the question on that Kathy's asked. I want to see what this baby elephant is going to decide to do. Come on, you can do it. Or is that just the best eating position? Eh? Ah, there we go bottom in the air very limber well done 10 out of 10 for style <laughs> okay now that the baby elephants up and moving we can answer Kathy's question so if we have a look back at our floppy eared elephant now Kathy's wondering about why that elephant's ear is floppy you actually you see floppy eared elephants it's in the middle there there we go you see floppy eared elephants quite frequently 
Um, I've known quite a few individuals, I've, I've worked in, and researched or at least helped researchers with individuals with floppy ears. It usually, it can, can be a birth defect from the very beginning. It can also be a break or an injury to the cartilage that simply hasn't healed or, or at least will never heal properly or never heal back into the normal shape of the ear. And that might have happened when the elephant was lying down, perhaps another elephant stood on it. Those are the, the sorts of possibilities. But what you'll find, I've noticed, and I think that sort of really does back up the, the genetic idea, genetic slight defect, is the fact that when you see a floppy-eared elephant, there's often another one in the herd. Now, I can't see one at the moment. I can only see that individual. Well, I'm trying to see that individual, but it's hiding away. But that's been my experience, is you often find more than one floppy-eared elephant in a herd. And sometimes you'll see them with two floppy ears. An elephant's ears are completely unique. That's one of the ways that elephants are identifiable. Now, if you really need to go into the nitty-gritty, the venation of the elephant's ears, so the structure of the blood vessels, is the most accurate way of identifying them. But it's actually easier to turn to the rips and the nicks and the tears in the ears. And when you can really closely examine them, when you really go, even elephants with seemingly perfect looking outlines, you usually find a little hole or a little nick or tear somewhere along the border of the ear. In this case, I'm struggling to find one. Little, little flap. And each, of course, each different marking, each sort of slight unevenness to the edge or the margin of the ear is given a name. So there are V-notches and there are U-notches and there are cup shapes. The most distinctive I think you'll all be thinking of, our regular viewers, you'll be thinking of Daryl, the elephant with the bell in his ear. Very, very clear bell-shaped hole. Hey, little one with your floppy ear. Don't you worry. It makes you unique. It means we'll always know you. I, uh, Jen B, are we talking about the, the baby, the baby baby or the floppy eared baby? So Jen B's noticed something that I haven't, and that is, she thinks, well, she's asking if one of the elephants has a growth behind its front left leg. Now I assume, what, was that correct, Faith? Front left leg. I suspect it's not that one that you mean. I'm looking to see, but now of course the baby's suckling, so it's hard to tell. And let me keep an eye out for you, Jen B, and I'll have a look and I'll see if I can spot what it was you were talking about. It's easily possible I could have been looking at one thing and I didn't notice it. I'll keep looking. Such a peaceful sighting. This is quite the floppy eared elephant is quite a large baby. Um, it's quite a big baby in terms of size. I'm sorry, um, that was really profound. It's quite a big baby in terms of size. No, Jamie, what else would it be big in? <laughs> silly, silly, silly point. Um, I actually meant it's quite an old calf to still be suckling. It's right at the point where it should be. It should be weaned. And it sort of brings us to Umkar's question because an elephant that size will already be already be feeding will already be feeding from the grass and the vegetation. They start to eat solid food at around about six months. So Umkar, to come back to your question, how much does a baby elephant drink per day? It'll be more when the elephant calf is right you know around about five months old before it's supplementing its diet but at this and is completely reliant on mom's milk and obviously is much larger at five months than it would be when it's newborn and you're looking at i think if i remember correctly it's around about 20 20 odd liters a day 
can be up to 20 odd liters a day. Maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more, depending on the age of the baby. I mean, you've seen, you must have seen the, the various clips of baby elephants being bottle fed. You see the size of those bottles that they drink from. Orphaned elephants. that sound right? 20 litres sounds like a lot. No, it could use, I guess it could be 20 litres. I'm trying to remember where, where I read it and exactly how much it was. So maybe between 15 and 20 litres. Sounds right, actually, for something that large. I mean, a baby is born at around about 100 kilograms. By the time it's five months old, it will have doubled that weight, or close to doubled that weight. Okay, team, we are going to go back to that leopard now, I've decided. Just having a quick sip of water now we must go because otherwise we won't get to spend nearly as much time as we would like to spend with it and it is starting to get cooler thank you Ellie's enjoy your afternoon lots of friends around oh bumpy bumpy it's gonna be my quickest way to get back probably just should retrace my steps I'm going to scoot on back to that leopard and spend as much time as I can with it before evening descends. I think that's pretty much what Brent is planning to do on the other side of the river with his cheetah. Well, uh, the boys, the boys, the boys, they are not being very active boys today. I'd say I think we found them after they had a big meal this morning. So I, I'm Jahawi and I have actually just been chatting whether we're going to see if we can find something else. There's a bit of yawning going on though. Oh. I say we give them another 12 minutes exactly before we decide what we're going to do next. And if they haven't haven't decided to move in 12 minutes, I think we're going to start heading back towards Silas. We've got quite a long way to go to get home. Uh, this evening we're probably about 20 k's or so 20 kilometers or so now i was telling you about those uh oh, no, I've, I've, flay ink flowers thank you Jao. um the flay ink th flowers we're talking about so i decided to just do a little bit more reading on them now they are pollinated exclusively by hawk moths at night even though there's been no scent ever recorded from them so i wonder whether being white on these short grasses the hawk moths are able to spot them at night um, or there's something else that's attracting them so that's one of those lovely little mysteries nature throws at us but i think the most awesome thing about them that um, I, I found out is that they are hemi parasites hemi parasites you say yes hemi parasites so what that means is that they are quite unique I haven't heard of many other hemi parasites. So they're a plant that can choose to be parasitic or not. So depending on circumstance, I suppose, uh, rain, weather, available nutrients, um, they can either use their roots to parasitize off other surrounding plants and grasses, or uh, they can use or just use whatever na nature is around them so if there's enough nutrients and water and stuff like that they won't be parasitic but if there isn't they can become parasitic on 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 the different grasses around them so the hemi a hemi parasite how cool is that so i say you learn new stuff every day and it's one of the most amazing things about being on safari You can see how strong the wind is because that flower is very close to the ground and is still being buffeted about. I should try to have a quick look. Unfortunately, the birds aren't being very kind anymore, uh, not coming close to us. But I hear we do have some questions about our spotted friends that are lying down there being very lazy. So the rangers have arrived, that's the rangers in that vehicle making sure people behave.
Hello, Ladybird. Ladybird would like to know if one of these male cheetah dies, would they replace him or would they remain at four? Ladybird, I'm almost certain they would remain at four. Uh, it takes time to build these coalition bonds and it has to be started when they're young. So if you start a bit late, I, you're not going to be able to be included into the coalition. Remember, they have already killed a young male cheetah um, of a similar age to them um, who had a collar on, a dispersal male. So they have already killed a male cheetah that they came in, in contact with. So they didn't let him join the gang, so to speak. So I think they would definitely um, not add another if one of them were to die. Oof, this wind is getting stronger. Now you can see the little croton bushes being pushed around and in this area we do there's a lot of strong wind and you'll notice there's not very many big trees uh, and that is a fabric of a fa or factor of having strong winds constantly and of course the soil types Verna is wondering, are there cheetah reintroduction programs in Africa? Yes, there are. And um, I think they've been recently reintroduced into Lewonde in Malawi. Um, and uh, Swaziland has also had them reintroduced. So there has been quite a few different spots where they have been reintroduced. In Southern Africa, there's a lot of reintroducement uh, programs into the private reserves, especially reserves that were once farmland that have now been converted into 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 game reserves uh, there's a lot of sp scope for cheetah to be reintroduced where my parents live the cheetah are reintroduced so that that is uh, they have been put into that area so that's very exciting we actually going to be getting some more cheetah this year so to, to mix up the bloodlines so that'll be very very exciting and of course there's those two male cheetah that i've spent a lot of time with on foot uh, on that reserve where my parents live so exciting times and yes a cheetah, the cheetah population over africa has actually increased quite considerably over the last 20 years or so by about a thousand five hundred so it is doing better they are doing better than they were okay boys you have seven minutes to do something what i don't think they're going to move much tonight i think they might even spend their whole night here hey some buffalo in the distance Walking through there's a long line of buffaloes. Now Josh was wondering, do cheetah lack focus when it comes to mating? Well, I wouldn't say they lack focus. The females uh, have a very unique need to be stimulated by multiple males before they actually go into full estrus and mate. So I wouldn't say they lack focus at all. Uh, cheetah mating is very focused and can be uh, quite low, loud for cheetahs. Lots of squeaks and scratchy noises. Hmm, boys, 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 I don't think you, I, I don't know if I've got the patience to last out the whole 12 minutes I said. How, how long have we got? We're halfway through. We've got six minutes left. I don't think they're going to do anything in the next six minutes, unfortunately. But, uh, it is, the temperature is dropping quickly. Daniel, Daniel is wondering, are cheetahs dangerous to people? No, they're not. Um, there's never been a recorded case of a cheetah attacking an adult outside of captivity. So uh, I know a lot of people, um, you might have not known at the time, you go pet a cheetah at one of these game parks. They're not game parks, they're petting zoos. And they're actually very, very bad, in my personal opinion. Uh, if you like wild animals, let them stay wild and free. There's no need to have you go tickle their ears. And that is uh, generally a human thing to make humans feel better about themselves. It's got no actual benefic benefit to the animals. A lot of them will claim breeding programs, which is a total and utter bad word nonsense. Um, so it really, really is absolutely, absolute nonsense. So uh, cheetah, cheetah breeding in captivity is really, really unsuccessful. They have a much higher success rate uh, in the wild. So there's a lot of places that pretend that they're doing this for the conservation of cheetah. They're not. They're just like having pet cheetah, which is not a nice thing in my opinion. But um, yeah.
that's otherwise I'll keep going. I can get on a real rant about that lot. So wherever you ever you get to touch a big cat, it's generally not a good place. One of the, the greatest examples of, of something like that is uh, the African grey parrots. Now, if you've ever managed to see an African grey parrot in the wild, they're such complex social birds and, and they talk to each other for hours and ages and in massive flocks of hundreds and then to go take a poor African grey and keep it by itself uh, with just you for company. It's just cruel. The only person you're keeping happy is yourself, not the bird. Now, Daniel was wondering what lives in the croton bushes. Uh, not too much. Uh, lots of different animals will, will utilize the croton bushes from time to time, like the cheetah, lion, uh, even leopard, uh, even wildebeest and zebra uh, for shade. For, um, nothing really eats crotons. They don't taste too nice. Um, there's, the, the English name is a fever berry. Um, so the birds, birds will utilize them as nests and stuff like that. But Croton bushes like this, where it's quite open, they'll, stuff will use it from time to time. The croton thickets on top of the hills and along the river are used by lots, a lot more different animals, such as dick dicks and, and leopard will use it more frequently. But um, these little crotons will be used from time to time, not, not, not constantly. Well, boys, it's been real, but I think we've got a long way to go. So we're going to start heading down towards the south, towards the Tanzanian border and back towards Sala's camp for the evening. Uh, they're of course looking after us and keeping us well fed and, 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 and well rested and, and showered and clean. So we've got about 20, 20 plus kilometers to travel. Um, as a crow flies probably about 10 but on the roads about 20 kilometers. So bye bye boys, we will be back looking for the musketeers early, early tomorrow morning. I think I'm going to try to get out a bit earlier than we did this morning and hopefully we can catch them while they're still on the move. Whoops, my shoe came off. But well, you never know, we might find a Miale on the way home. She could be on the move. I think I've lost communication with Final Control again.